The next reading of Holy Scripture comes from Mark chapter 7. Our sermon text is verses 24 to 30, but we're going to read from verse 14. So if you'll open your Bibles to Mark chapter 7, let's stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. I hadn't forgotten. Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 14. This is God's word. And he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me. All of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And from there, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So far the reading of Holy Scripture, we give thanks for it. You may be seated. As we come to consider this passage, let us pray for God's help. Oh God, how rightly and easily there is a sense in which we know we don't belong at your table. And yet, the blessings of Christ fall to all who will come to him. In our most desperate moments, we can call out and know that those who aren't depending on status, prestige, position, but those who are leaning upon the Lord Jesus have their prayers heard. And we are relieved of our burdens. We know that uh, there is no reason in us why we should gain from Christ's reward. And yet we know that he has paid our ransom has set us free, and we are glad to be his. And so we pray that we might have a fresh sense 
of your abundant blessings in Christ this morning. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your word to bring forth fruit in our hearts, to love you more, to serve you better. We ask it all for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, Back when the world used cash, uh, it it used to be a, a phrase of generosity when when someone when when people would say something like keep the change right they by some sort of contract or agreement or promise had committed to giving a a certain amount of money and when handing over the committed sum rather than demanding an even settling and even settling up of the excess currency they they just leave the over an abundant amount to their recipient as well and in that circumstance no one has to my knowledge ever accused this generous person of of not holding up their obligation because they gave more than what they originally committed Oftentimes we can miss how God fulfills his promises in an abundant generosity without asking for the change back. He doesn't give his people the bare minimum of what he committed to do. Our God is the God who always outdoes his own goodness and reveals his splendid provision, kindness, and blessing to his people. In Christ, we meet the fullness of that fullness. And here in Mark 7, 24 to 30, we see the, the implications trailing out of the, the previous events recorded in this gospel. In the, in the first stretch of chapter 7, Jesus clashed with the religious establishment yet again, and this time over the issue of, of purity, cleanness, and, and defilement. <clears throat> the, the religious leaders of that day had built an elaborate system of, of rules that supplemented God's true law, setting an, like an artificial bar for what defiled someone in connection even to the the sacrificial system. They were trying to give padding. If you don't break our rules, you won't break God's rules. And yet, they took it so far as to, they made their rules so that you could break God's rules. At at a more basic level than than what they were doing, God had, had imposed a set of ceremonial laws that marked Israel as his distinct people among the nations. These ceremonial laws drew a circle around them, sort of showing that they were his. He had promised to give his people the promised land, using that system to set them apart, which included laws about the sort of food that they could eat. And in, in the previous section of Mark's gospel, we, we saw that Jesus declared all foods clean, pushing back against Pharisaical religion by, by drawing attention to how, well, our sin is what truly defiles us. Not even the, the ceremonial laws that, that God had imposed to illustrate what uncleanness before the Lord is like. Those weren't about true defilement, but about an illustration of what that defilement is like. In in the sequel to Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees about that, where he declared all foods clean, well, we come to learn 
the wider implications for the scope of God's work in redemptive history. Jesus did not come just to widen the remit of what food God's people could eat. He came to tear down the dividing wall, one, between God and sinners so that we could be reconciled, but between Jew and Gentile altogether so that all who believe in him are equally and in the same way made clean before God as his true everlasting people. God had promised a small plot of land to Israel, his people, and in Jesus Christ, he gives the whole world, including the new creation, to every believer from every tribe, tongue, and nation. God made a promise, but doesn't take back the change as he goes over and above what he committed to do in the first place. So our main point is that Christ saves one people for God through faith in himself. Christ saves one people for God through faith in himself. So our three points today are the shock, the support, and the significance. So first, let's, let's think about the shock. And really, we're, we're thinking about how this story is, is a bit abrupt, a bit jarring in a couple of different ways. So the situation uh, here in verses 24 to 30 uh, is jarring even on the surface because of the conversation and remains jarring as we poke a bit more deeply at its significance. So the, the, the events are straightforward enough. Jesus took his disciples away from the Galilean region in hopes of finding a place where they might finally be left alone for some rest. And, and as he ate in, in someone's house, it became obvious that, well, they wouldn't be left alone. Uh, as this woman approached him to get him to heal her daughter. The, the details here are more striking. So in, in his attempt to find kind of a peaceful reprieve for himself and his disciples, Jesus goes to Tyre and Sidon, Gentile territory. It's the, it's the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak. Right, right, imagine being uh, so put out with the attention that you're getting that the apparent best solution is to go to the bad part of town <laughs> just because you assume that no one would follow you there. And then I can finally have a bit of distance. And that's similar, really, to what's happening here. Even more striking than that, though, is Jesus' conversation with this Syrophoenician woman. Right? Mark, having already made it clear that they've gone to, to Gentile territory, put it on the nose that this, this woman, who is confident enough to come to speak to their rabbi, was a Gentile. So there's, at least for the original readers, there's already a few things kind of digging at them about this story. Reading this on on the first hand, reading this passage lined up with the previous events would already have the, the Jewish audience on edge. Jesus declared all foods clean. That's a big deal already. He's messing with the status quo and and putting himself in in God's place since God was the one who set these food laws in place for them. And, And now, on top of that, 
He's crossed the border. He's going into Gentile territory. If, if the food thing started the boat tilting, well, now he's full bore rocking it. And then we can add on top of that that now a, a woman is talking to him. This is forward practice, right? And, and, and she's a Gentile woman. And so the, the details here are not just mere information. They're a machine gun fire of Jesus breaking the expectations. And when this woman asked Jesus for a miracle to save her daughter, Jesus' response is an abrupt, startler, startling, unsettling reply as well. You've asked me for something, but why should dogs get food for, that's for the children? Well, <laughs> and nonetheless, nonetheless, in, in light of her response, Jesus grants her request. He, he concedes that this Gentile woman understands the realities of faith. And so he healed her daughter. We have to recognize then that these verses are a lightning rod, loaded with freight about what Jesus was accomplishing. Whereas he had just rebuked the Jewish leaders for their, their lack of faith amongst Right, the national people of God. Here he's commending a Gentile for her understanding. And so to, to put a fine point on this, Jesus was blessing a Gentile in ways that Jews had long thought were just for them. Jesus was breaking the barrier between Jew and Gentile concerning what constitutes God's people, and he was redrawing the lines around himself. So the shock was that Jesus was taking the kingdom of God to the Gentiles. That brings us to our second point, the, the support, because I think I need to defend that. Uh, and so we're going to support it. We've seen a theme throughout Mark's gospel, that the question is, who is Jesus and, and what is his kingdom like? And, and while a string of previous passages beat the drum about who Jesus is, namely God the Son, come as Savior of God's people, Mark 7 is circling back to that theme about the nature of, of his kingdom. So we, we've had a, a stretch establishing that first bit, who Jesus is, and now we're thinking, what's his kingdom like? So despite several instances circling the claim, uh, the, the main payoff here isn't, isn't just like raw doctrinal points about Israel and the church. The main payoff here is to see God's amazing grace at work as he presses the promises of his mercy beyond the limits that he'd set previously. God's not reneging promises by doing more than the baseline of his commitments, but he is outstripping his own generosity. Our God is the God who, who always outdoes himself in being good to his people. All the same, the, the whole scripture drives toward this point that, that God would make one people for himself from across the world. 
that he would eventually bring Jew and Gentile together as his people. So in the New Testament, we read how Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, and I'm thinking particularly of verses 12 to 16, that writing to Gentiles, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Meaning that true Israel was true Israel was always defined in relation to God's Messiah. To be alienated from Christ, or to be separated from Christ, is to be alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And they were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, You who were once far off have been brought near. Well, near to what? Near to Christ. And near to the commonwealth of Israel. For he himself is our peace. Who has made us both one. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments like he does in Mark 7, expressed in ordinances, that he might in himself create one new man, right? The people of God in the new covenant in the place of two, Jew and Gentile, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Jesus did away with everything that distinguishes Jew and Gentile in God's plan for history, clarifying that true Israel is made of those who trust in Jesus. This is not in the slightest that God discarded Israel. It's not what it it says in the least. It's that Gentiles are now included in Israel as God's people. So that God's nation, which is not a political state, is made from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so that, as Paul calls it, the church is the Israel of God. And what's even better is that God had actually always promised to do this. Isaiah 49, 6 in the NIV. It is, this is astounding that God would say this. It is, a, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. God declared that he wouldn't limit the scope of his promises to this little nation state, since that, in his own words, was too small. I'm going to do bigger than what I first said I'd do. I'm going to go more into this. I'm going to take salvation Everywhere, My Messiah would rescue, will rescue people from all nations, so making true Israel to be composed of believers in the Lord Jesus, full stop. And God even promised Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And drawing upon that, foundational promise Paul explained why the theocracy of national Israel was a temporary parenthesis in God's plan for history so in Galatians 3 24 to 29 so then the law meaning there the Mosaic covenant was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So the the Mosaic Covenant is 
abrogated. It's done its job. And its temporariness has given way to its disappearance. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And so the support, the support for seeing Jesus' actions here as taking his salvation to the other nations, as bringing Gentiles into his kingdom, well, I mean, it comes from all Scripture, which unfolds the full scope of God's promises to have one covenant people In the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true substance, the whole sum, the full scope of all of God's works in history. Jesus Christ is the focus of our faith, our hope, and God's dealings with sinners. And that brings us to our final point. The significance. So this this recalibration of Christ's kingdom has profound ramifications for our encouragement and discipleship. And and I realize, especially the last point, was a bit information heavy. And, And now we're trying to open up. How does this help us? All right. I think the first thing is, it's a beautiful thing that God has one kingdom, and it's a gospel kingdom. That this, this is the focus he's given us now. We, very thankfully, as God's people, don't have to think about, at, at, right, on our own terms, policies and diplomacy and international relations, because we are international, And our diplomacy is, God loves you, will you come to believe in Jesus? And that's a beautiful thing. When we start to think more personally, we ought to note, uh, Jesus' very stern-sounding retort, which I think opens up a lot for our reflection about the Christian life. Right, he says to this woman who's in need, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, which seems rather abrupt. I mean, at, at first blush, this even seems like a, a rejection of her request, doesn't it? Do, doesn't it seem like He's turning her down. Now, the rest of the narrative shows how that's not the case. But we can tie that very factor into our own prayer life. Because doesn't it often feel like God is going to say no when you approach him for what you need? Very clearly, it seemed like that for the Syrophoenician woman, too. And yet, Jesus' response was just stretching her faith so that she might rejoice all the more as he answers her prayers. I think we have to reckon with this had to be at least one of, if not her most desperate moment. I mean, her daughter was possessed by a demon. The the stakes could hardly be higher than that. And when you are in desperate straits, believer, never lose hope that despite all appearances... 
Christ hears your prayers. Christ knows our needs. He hears our pleas and will give us exactly what we need in the way that best builds our faith. Like he did here. And Christ is at the ready to provide for his children. Don't we need to remember here that Mark wrote his gospel recording the Apostle Peter's testimony toward the end of his life. Don't don't we need to remember that he wrote it for Christians during a time of increasing social pressure from their government or even expecting real hardship and trial in their culture? And, And so this connection to desperate moments, to the gospel's very purpose isn't spurious, but, but part of Mark's real intention for his readers to disciple them nearer to Christ. Because for them, in that time, it might look like Jesus had a stern response to their prayers for relief. And And here we see Mark presenting Christ as the one who who responds to prayer for people who come to him knowing their need, knowing that they don't deserve his grace, but knowing that he is gracious. So we ought to... Reckon all the more with how there are are no boundaries keeping someone who comes to Christ, keeping them away from his grace. This woman didn't belong at God's table. And yet, Jesus gave her a seat. We don't we easily feel like we don't belong at God's table. Our sin easily overwhelms us, leaving us thinking, how could God love somebody like me? Especially if especially if I admit all the ways that I don't belong in his presence. And yet, Jesus approves this woman's response that that even dogs get the same blessings as children. At the same time, since they're eating under the table as the children eat. And so he, he welcomed those who don't belong to get the same blessings as those who do. And yet, no... Sinner belongs in God's presence. But Jesus makes it so that forgiven sinners do. While we ought to be cast away like dogs, Jesus let himself be cast away in our place so that he could make a seat for us at his table. Whereas we built the dividing wall between ourselves and God by our sin, Jesus destroys it by dropping the full weight of his cross upon it. Jesus said, shed his blood so that those who merely hoped to scavenge under the table would have a plate set for them at the wedding feast of the Lamb when Jesus returns and makes all things New. Christ is the Savior powerful enough to make dogs into his family. And Jesus' actions here show us again the nature of his kingdom. Whereas the Pharisees demanded that God's kingdom get political, restoring the land to national Israel, Jesus rips up their 
expectations and blasts his gospel kingdom to the ends of the earth, distributing full blessings to everyone who believes in him. None of you are beyond the love of Christ because Christ shows that his kingdom is about tearing down every limit that was set for his love. His kingdom is the gospel kingdom, aimed for the whole world. And he's not done. His kingdom marches on as the gospel goes out. Every new church plant is a new embassy claiming new soil for the kingdom of God. Every Lord's Day is a convocation of heavenly citizens gathered to hear their king who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And every gospel announcement is the storming of the forces of this age as God promises to give the nations to his son. And so in our most desperate moments, we remember That as God claims the whole world for Jesus, when his people expected one nation, he pours out salvation, renewal, restoration, reconciliation, creating a new family that will last forever in the age to come. Showering us with more more abundant blessings than we could ever truly comprehend and God never takes his change back let's pray Father God we are thankful that Jesus Christ is the yes and amen to every good thing that you have promised for your people and we are thankful that in Jesus Christ you make us your people and so We ask that not only would you help us rejoice at that truth, but that when we find ourselves in our most desperate moments, we remember that Jesus Christ hears those who shouldn't be heard. He makes room for us. And he is ready to respond to those who lean upon him. Fill us with confidence about that, that your grace knows no borders and you have claimed us and you will claim all things for your glory. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.